All right. So here we are in chapter 8 of 2 Corinthians. Now, before we get here, if, if you have a subheading above your, your chapter 8, what's it say? What's it say there? Someone tell me. Collection for Lord's people. What else did I hear? Generosity encouraged. Okay. What's that? Calls. A calls for generous giving. Okay. All three of those say the same thing. We're talking about money today. Directly in what Paul speaks of here. But not just money. When we're talking about giving. We can also include the giving of time, the giving of service, the giving of talents, whatever you want to include in there. All of the principles here, all the encouragement here can apply to all those areas. But today Paul talks directly to the Corinthians about a commitment they made back in chapter 16 of 1 Corinthians. Let's go turn back there real quick and let's see what we're talking about, okay? Chapter 16 of 1 Corinthians. Keep your hand in 2 Corinthians 8. We're coming back there. What's it say above chapter 16 of 1 Corinthians? A collection for the Lord's people. For the saints. Now about the collection for the Lord's people. Do what I told the Galatian churches to do. On the first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with your income, saving it up so that when I come, no collection will have to be made. Then when I arrive, I will give letters of introduction to the men you approve and send them with your gift to where? Jerusalem. Okay? They had made this church in Corinth, made a commitment to help support the Jewish church. Why did the Jewish church need to be supported? The Jewish church needed to be supported because, well, it didn't need to be supported. Let me say this again. Not the church. The, the saints. The saints of Jerusalem could use some help. And Paul is bringing that message to them. Now, it wasn't just this church that he brought it to. But we see in chapter 1 that they made a verbal commitment. They would like to, yeah, that's a good idea. Let's do that. Let's take a collection. Well, by the time we're here in, in this letter in 2 Corinthians, the Corinthian church had not done that yet. Okay, the gift had not made it to Jerusalem yet. All right, so here he is. And he's going to encourage them in the commitment they made. Now, he's going to be talking about Two different churches in this chapter. One, of course, is Corinth. But he's also going to be talking about a group of churches out of Macedonia. Now, the Macedonian churches, let's, let's just realize here, they are in the northern area, the northern region of Greece. Okay? And Corinth is in the lower region of Achaia, which is in southern Greece. Okay? Okay? Now, the thing about this Macedonian church, as we read here, we're going to read about a lot about suffering, a lot about poverty, because Alexander the Great, that used to be this area of these three churches, Philippi, Thessalonica, and Berea, used to be other, uh, uh, under, the, under the rule of Alexander the Great. And when the Romans defeated Alexander the Great, they took off much of the wealth of that area. Okay, so we find them poorer off than what the church in Corinth is because the city of Corinth at this time, again, is very materialistic. That's why Paul had to write the letter of 1 Corinthians to them. Materialistic, their focus is on the world. Their focus was on bringing in some, some false teaching from previous religions that they're coming out of into Christianity. So let's pick up here in chapter 8 if I haven't confused you too much already. And now, brothers and sisters... We want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. In the midst of a very severe trial, their, over, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability. 
entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people. And they exceeded our expectations. They gave themselves first of all to the Lord and then by the will of God also to us. So we urged Titus, just as he had earlier made a beginning to bring also to completion this act of grace on your part. So since you excel in everything, in faith and speech and knowledge and complete earnestness and in love we have kindled in you, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. I am not commanding you, but I want you to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. For you know that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. Paul is comparing, bringing to their attention the, the grace and the move out of severe poverty and, and hardship of the Macedonian churches giving money to those in Jerusalem who are hurting, those who are struggling. You think, well, why in Jerusalem? Well, there were a lot of things came into play that the saints went through hardships in the city of Jerusalem. Okay? And we can do more research on that another time if we need to. But for sake of time here, we just know that they're struggling. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, again, verse 9, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. He's using the comparison of what Christ had done for them. Okay? We can see him starting to build a basis for the Corinthian church to give, for their hearts to realize we should be giving. And here is my judgment, verse 10, about what is best for you in this matter. Last year, you were not, last year, you were the first not only to give, but also to have the desire to do so. Now finish the work so that your eager willingness to do it may be matched by your completion of it according to your means. For if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. Our desire is not that others might be relieved while you are hard-pressed, but that there might be equality. At the present time, your plenty will supply what they need, so that in turn, their plenty will supply what you need. The goal is equality. As it is written, the one who gathered much did not have too much. And the one who gathered little did not have too little. Okay, you see, this is where... This is where the church of Christ should be sharing with each other. God's church in America should be sharing with each other. But that only starts when it, it happens within the church too. For you can't gain that desire to help others and let those in your own church family struggling when they have a need. That's kind of hypocritical, right? It's kind of an oxymoron. Okay? There has been talk in this church, whether it will ever happen or not, I don't know, but putting a box or a bucket in the back where we just give uh, extra for those in the church that have a need. Right now we do a benevolence fund. So much of our budget goes into a benevolence fund to help people in the church that have needs that arise. But I wonder sometimes if we limit the amount that's in that benevolence fund because we put it in our budget instead of letting it happen by heart in the back of our church. You understand what I'm saying? The money you have and the money I have, do we realize it doesn't belong to us? Do we? Paul shares the blessing that he's seen in the Macedonian believers. He shares it with the church in Corinth as they have already, they have already stepped up to provide financial help for the Jerusalem believers, and the church in Corinth has not completed their commitment yet. We see that the Macedonian believers were givers. Again, being formerly the homeland of Alexander the Great, being taken by the Romans. Let me tell you a little bit about the wealth that was in that area, a little bit about Alexander the Great. In his heyday, 
Alexander the Great created one of the largest empires of the ancient world. With it stretching from Greece to northwestern India. As he was a ruler, a conqueror, and an explorer. Again, eventually the Romans overthrew his kingdom. In which they took most of the wealth of this area. That's why the Macedonian church. That's why Paul's bragging on them a little bit. That's why he's encouraging the church in Corinth of the work that the Lord did through the churches and their hearts to help brothers and sisters in Christ. That's why he's speaking about what they've done with so little. A testimony of how we can give to others even when we don't have much. There is a common sense, my friends, that I don't go out and help everybody in the world when, when I have debt myself. Okay? My heart pulls to people. Our hearts pull to people that are in need. We see it all over the city of Hagerstown, men and women with cardboard signs, and some look ragged, some look better off than others. But I don't know about you that even though I've made some decisions to be wiser and discern in my giving in that way, it still pulls at your heart, right? Because what if? What if I could make a difference there? But I've been, great, been given great wisdom that you really need to discern that because what good are you doing for yourself per se if you're not taking care of your needs while giving to others. Because if I don't care of my needs, how much can I really help somebody else? Getting to that point where we can give hilariously one day. Because more funds are available because we have them. It's not to store for myself. It's to prepare myself to be wiser with the Lord's money and use it in a larger way for his kingdom. Again, I may have needs and I have, may have debts, but within the church and the family of God, we are called to help each other. Two dollars, five dollars. Maybe I don't go to Starbucks. Well, I don't go to Starbucks. Maybe I don't go to Dunkin' Donuts or Sheets for as many cups of coffee this week and I give that money into that bucket and back or into the plate, into the budget, whatever it is. We've forgotten that in many ways as a church. We've read of the early church. Everyone shared their possessions. Remember in the book of Acts? Everybody shared their possessions. Barnabas went out and he sold his property to give to those in need for the common cause. You may be sitting here today and saying, Pastor Brad, I don't have, I don't have money to share like that. I hear you. I ask that you take that to the Lord and let him challenge you in that. What has he promised? That he would meet every one of our needs. That promise is still a promise even when he's telling us to step up and help each other. The brothers and sisters in Christ with needs that arise. The promise doesn't go away. It resounds clearly in these times. It's amazing when we take all these principles and all these teachings in scripture and we put them together and we start living together how well we see God do his job. And it's not a job he has to do. And it's not a job. It's his love upon us. He provides for us no matter what. Problem is we get hooked up in our wants, right? We get hooked up in our wants. Our wants costs more money than what we ever figured because we've got to take care of those things we get that's our want. Just think about vacation. Last time you we went on vacation, I'm not talking to the Longs, they just got back from vacation, but let's think about vacation. You go on vacation, you rent the place where you're going to stay. That's a little bit of money. You get there and you think you're going to, in our case, you think you're going to buy all the groceries so you can cook in the place where you are and save some money. But then as you're going up the coastal highway many times, you start seeing these restaurants you've never been to. Okay? 
Or, hey, there's a Dunkin' Donuts. They're the same donuts wherever you are as they are in Hagerstown too. It's not you know, like you're getting anything new there. But there's just something about a Dunkin' Donuts donut, right? There's something about a Dunkin' Donuts coffee or whatever brand, whatever, wherever you go, you tend to, and I'm as guilty as anybody else, as I said Dunkin' Donuts, my wife shook her head, she knows. I'm a Dunkin' Donut man, okay? There's always extras because we're on vacation. We deserve that. You. Those are three harmful, dangerous words. We're in a nation that feels that we have to have vacations. And I'm right there with you. Sometimes I just feel like I need to get away. There's nothing wrong with vacations. But my friends, if, it, if, if things, let's take vacation out of the picture, if things cause us to be so strapped that we can't help others who are Christians, then we're putting our things and our wants above what the Lord has called us to do. Do we get that? That's pretty harsh. We don't like to hear that in America, right? I deserve a break. I deserve a vacation. I deserve uh, a new vehicle. I deserve this. I deserve that. What does scripture say? What do we know? We deserve nothing. If God hadn't breathed breath in us, we wouldn't be here to enjoy any of this stuff. And if it wasn't his hand of provision to us, we wouldn't be receiving these things that we receive. Even though we think they're our wants and our needs, he's the one that determines what we have. He may allow us to have it to teach us a lesson as well. One big lesson I learned, and I'm going to bounce off of this then, but one lesson I really learned in this process of what we have is when Shri and I got a 25-foot pull-behind camper. It was a used camper. This was in the, what, mid-90s, late-90s, and it was a mid-80s model. It was as faded as all get out on the outside, but the inside was awesome, and it was, it was laid out perfectly for our family. We fell in love with it. Once I got my wife in the door, she fell in love with it. That camper needed a truck to pull it. And I had an extended cab F-150 that could pull that puppy like nothing else. Looked down at going up the interstate one time to Gettysburg, and I was doing 80, or no, 76 miles an hour, heading up 81, pulling this 6,500-pound camper behind me. I'm glad Shri didn't see the speedometer. I was like, whoa, I need to back off. But you know what? That truck didn't last too long, and it was newer than a camper. It got rusty. The engine had problems. I had run into a couple poles on a, a, a pole on a camping trip one time, bent the front end. It was still running though. But when that truck died, my want, or what I thought was a need, because we had started camping, I needed to move up to a bigger camper because I just couldn't camp in the smaller one, you know, any longer with the growth of the family. So that want or that need that I thought it was. It had to go away. I had no way to pull it. Had no truck anymore. Had no way to pull it. I learned real quick. Watch out for the, the wants and the things you think are needs. Because not only was it an issue that broke my heart when we couldn't pull it anymore, but it was an issue that I was constantly working on that thing, which was taking time and was taking money. That's with anything, guys. And that's why the Lord teaches so much about where our focus is. Teaches so much about, about where we are to put our time and put our money. And let's just talk about time here a little bit. When was the last time, I'm going to step on a toe here. Or maybe a few. When was the last time you were here for anything other than a Sunday morning service? Did he just say that? When was the last time you were here for anything other than Sunday morning service? You have been called, you believe at least, because that's why you started coming here. You believe this is a church home that, that the Lord has brought you to and you want to get plugged into. 
This is one where maybe you've taken membership here, or maybe you're just a regular attender here. But you know what? If this is what you call, quote, your church home, this is your church body, and you're part of a body. And if you're not functioning in your position in this place, wherever that may be, the body is hurting. The body can't be as effective is what it needs to be. Well, I'm too old to do things. You're never too old. The Lord still has you here. Be part of your body. Find something you can do. Encouragement. Writing notes. Being a prayer warrior. Stop it in and encourage people. Maybe as you sit in a chair, while others are doing things, you're encouraging them. As we talk about giving here, let's keep our minds focused on something more than just financial. Let's get back here as we go, as I've gone off the bunny trail a little bit, or off the trail a little bit. Paul, again, is using the Macedonian church as a testimony to those who, no matter their situation, are still willing to give to help others. Okay? They were what? They were one in mind. There's a screen there. There They were one in mind and heart. We'll keep moving. They were one in mind and heart. They shared everything. It's what we just read. And there were no needy persons among them, the believers. God's grace was powerfully at work in them. In the midst of of poverty. You know, those three points I just made <laughs> come out of Acts when he's talking about the early church. But we see the same similar thing. I switched those, I apologize. We see so the same similar thing here in the church as Paul talks about they gave as much as they were able. They upon or, uh, beyond their ability, entirely on their own, and they even pleaded Knowing that they had not as much as what other churches had, they willingly pleaded with Paul to be part, to take part, that we can help this church. Paul's like, no, 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 you don't have no, no. They're like, no, we want to be. Don't take this away from us. We want to be part of this, to be a blessing. Above and beyond what they seemed they could do. Now, as we move on here, in 13, we see him close this portion. Our desire is not that others might be relieved. Again, making this point. Our desire is not others may be relieved that they have a cushiness, a cushy time while you are hard pressed. But there might be equality. If I know that one of my brothers in my family is hurting, then I'm going to reach out and do whatever I can even beyond my ability at times, I want to be excited to be able to step up beside my brother. I'm talking about my physical brother, my biological brother. One of my brothers step up and help them. Why? Because they're my brother. And maybe not in a financial way, they both make good money. But how many times have we done this with neighbors and friends in the way of going and digging a ditch with them, or moving rocks with them, or helping them mow their grass, or paint their house, or move in or move out, but yet in the church body, in the church body, we have such a hard time finding time to do that. It's almost like we're willing to do that for our neighbors and our friends, but when it comes to the church body, we're not ready to do that. We're not willing to give up that time. Now, I'm not saying all of us. There's many of you here that do this, but I'm just saying in general, if you're a part of this church family, you should be financially helping each other. We should be physically helping each other. We should be prayerfully helping each other. And we should be spiritually walking and helping each other. That's what it means to give. And time to give, as we said numerous times already, takes time out of my personal schedule, which is full of my needs and my wants. That's how successful, fellowshipping, getting along, doing the things of Jesus Christ church functions. 
This is life. Or at least it should be. This family here is life. And your family that you have life in brings benefit into this family. And it shouldn't be that I'll squeeze time in for here when I have time. It should be that, wow, these things are important, so I'm going to be here. So maybe I'll take this Saturday that I do my own yard and I do all these things. Maybe I'll take this Saturday and go do this for someone or for the church or whatever's going on. My friends, the early church was an area of society. It was an area of social interchanging and being. It was a place of life. And that's what Christ wanted it to be when he set up the church. Do not forsake the gathering of the saints. Well, pastor, I'm not. I go Sunday morning every Sunday. I go when there's a free movie night. I gather when there's a game night. And boy, I tell you what, the food on Sunday morning is amazing. Hey, how about coming out and spending some time for this new vacation Bible school that's going on in July? Oh, I'm busy. It's too hot. In the evening, I'm tired and I want to rest. My friends, I think if we really sit and think about it, we realize that we're missing out on following this call to help out beyond what we think we can do financially, physically, and as a church body. Prayerfully and spiritually as a church body. At the present time, verse 14, your plenty will supply what they need so that in turn their plenty will supply what you need. I have found it in my simple life that when I am willing to give, it always comes back. I don't do it to get back. If that's the case, you're not going to get back. Unless somebody feels, well, I got to. Then you don't want that, do you? Well, I got to step up and help. That's not what you want. When you give out of your heart, when you give as a call of God upon your life, he promises that he will in return give back through those people or somebody else in another way. Whew. Why are we trusting anything else? They welled up and gave out of their generosity, not out of their Abundant funds, they gave out of their generosity from the heart. Maybe you want to say, well, pastor, they must have had hidden treasures somewhere. Hidden treasures somewhere. Maybe they have mason jars buried in the sand behind their houses. Right? Or maybe you want to say, People don't really do that. That's an amazing story. I'm not sure that's real. As many people who say, mm, they're principles. Mm, they're not real teachings. I'm not sure that's all real. When they look at the Bible, that's eh, real. It's right there. I can understand giving because you want to help, but nobody gives out of their poverty. Oh, my friends, you got something to give. How do I know that? Because God saved you and God put you here. And where he plants you, he wants to use you and grow you. Macedonians did. And Paul used them here to challenge the church in Corinth to follow through. It sounds like as we go back as we go back a little bit before we move forward, if we go back again a little bit, so uh, as he speaks to them, he tells them, uh, where is it here? Well, I missed it here. We'll go past that point, okay? All right, a little hiccup there. It's not a problem. But he compares here 
which again is the most important thing. He compares for us in verse nine, he has us step up with how much we're willing to give in view of what Christ gave to us. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor. So you through his, his poverty, yeah, who was he? He stepped away from all his wealth, right? To come, to, to come and be man, to live amongst us. And in his poverty, he gave of his life for us so we could have the riches of heaven, the riches of a life covered in grace through the blood of Jesus Christ. Boy, that should spur us on no matter what financial or time restraints we're in or how abundant we are in those things, that should move us on just to do for his kingdom. Amen? That's the driving force. What he's done for us should push us to do for his kingdom. Where can I do that? Are you even excited about that? Do you realize in your head that you're here for his kingdom in your heart that he wants you to grow his kingdom? He wants to do it through you. What have we already read? We are his ambassadors through our last couple weeks. That's what Paul reminds them. We are his ambassadors. It's as if he's pleading with the world through us, which he really is. When do, we, when do we shift gears to get our, ba- our minds back in, back in order that we're not here for ourselves? We get to enjoy life and what God blesses us with in life because he gave us life. But he didn't give us life just to enjoy it and waste it here. He gave us life with this message of reconciliation to impact the world for him so that others may know him. Oh, don't we constantly need to be made aware of that? If we may, turn your Bible to, if we may, we're going to, to Luke 21, just as another reminder about this whole mindset of giving. Luke 21. We're going to pick up in the first verse. Jesus looked up and he saw the rich putting their gifts into the temple treasury. He also saw a poor widow put in two very small copper coins. Truly, I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all the others. All these people gave their gifts out of their wealth, but she gave out of her poverty. But she, I'm sorry, out of her poverty, put in all she had to live on. Why would he put a, a story, an account of that in scripture if he didn't want us to understand the importance of giving beyond what we have? Giving out of our wealth does not engage the heart. That's easy to do. I can't say the heart isn't touched at all. But how much more are we engaged in our giving and understanding that one, God will provide for us. Two, that God will use us no matter what the amount is. How much more effective it is if it's hurting us to give. It's a sacrifice. It's a sacrifice to give up our time. It's a sacrifice to give up our money. It's a sacrifice to give up anything, to let somebody else use. We have been blessed. Shree and I have been blessed in years to be able to visit the beach sometimes because somebody let, let us use their house. That's a form of giving as much as what giving money is. Giving of something that you have out of, your, out, of, out of what you have to help somebody else out for refreshment or encouragement. Buying somebody some tickets to go to a ball game and ask, to, ask them to go along with you so that you can have some good brother and sister time where maybe you can encourage each other. Look, you find the way that the Lord wants you to find, but it takes a sacrifice. We see that Christ sacrificed for us. He is the prime example, the perfect example of giving. David Guzik in his commentary, the Enduring Word commentary, states that in giving, the real issue isn't giving money. 
It is giving ourselves to the Lord. If we really catch this, if we really give ourselves to the Lord, then the right kind of material giving will happen. The material giving to the need will take place. Did you get that? If we really give ourselves to the Lord, then the right kind of material giving to the need will take place. It's a matter of giving ourselves to the Lord and what the Lord has for us. And the Lord will speak to us. The Lord will lead us in giving and how we're to give. But if we've got our, if we got our minds set on what's mine, well, then we've already started closing a door to the fact that the Lord could move in that situation, speak to us, to give in a way we weren't expecting. But are we walking close enough to the Lord to have a desire to do what he's asked us to do and to listen to him or to hear him speaking to us regarding that? One has said that Christian giving is established in terms not of quantity. Christian giving is established in terms not of quantity, but of sacrifice. When it changes your time situation, when it changes your financial situation, it draws you in to be more engaged on the decision to help. In church, we have helped, if I may take the attitude of Paul a little bit, we have helped a lot of missionaries. We have helped families in this church and extended off of people in this church in abundant ways. And this is not, I'm not coming at you today as smacking hands or speaking as if you're not giving. It's a reminder that God gives us through Paul to keep our heads straight on what we're here for. As we move into chapter 16, he says, Thanks be to God who put into the heart of Titus the same concern I have for you. For Titus not only welcomed our appeal, but he is coming to you with much enthusiasm and on his own initiative. We are sending along with him the brother who is praised by all the churches for his service to the gospel. What is more, he was chosen by the churches to accompany us as we carry the offering which we administer in order to honor the Lord himself and to show our eagerness. We don't know who this other brother is. We can speculate, but we don't know who that is. But what, we, what Paul says from that point forward is, he was, this brother was chosen by the churches to accompany us as we carry the offering which we administer in order to honor the Lord himself and to show our eagerness to help. Paul was explaining to them that we are just not taking money and we're not just running with it. Paul is making sure that those that gave can trust him continually to do the work that he's been called to do to take that money back to Jerusalem. He's not just saying, give me money, I'm going to do something with it. No, he's already set up, which we, you know, hopefully we in the church are doing a good job with this before you guys, that before we spend any money, we are doing the job of investigating, we are doing the job of setting up the right principles and processes to make sure that money gets to where it's going. And that's exactly what Paul's talking about here when Timothy's on his way to come gather the collection. Verse 20, we want to avoid any criticism of the way we administer this liberal gift, this gift that you're given liberally. For we are taking pains to do what is right, not only in the eyes of the Lord, but also in the eyes of man. Boy, there's, there's some things to learn there, right? Sometimes we do the right things in the Lord, but do it the wrong way in man's eyes where we lose our testimony and lose opportunities many times to ever have the chance to do something right of the Lord in front of them again. And the only thing I'd say about that is, my friends, is we're in this country right now and we're seeing our government go crazy and we're seeing all this stuff take place. There's not once in the Bible that Jesus Christ tells us to revolt. Did you catch that? Do you know that? We're not leading a revolt. We can disagree and we can stand and we can protest, but we're not called to revolt. We're called to, in all that we do, 
to present Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ not once revolted against the Roman government. In fact, many times he adhered to their laws. Because he wasn't about changing a government of a state or a country or a city. He was about changing the hearts of man. And that's what we're still about doing, right? Right? In addition, verse 22, we are sending with them our brother who has often proved to us in many ways that he is zealous and now even more so because of his great confidence in you. As for Titus, he is my partner and co-worker among you. As for our brothers, they are representatives of the churches and and an honor to Christ. Therefore, show these men the proof of your love and the reason for our pride in you so the churches can see it. Follow through. We've already talked about you giving. Please follow through. You've made that commitment. Step up and follow through. Get busy about the the work of the Lord. And I can continue to talk about how you guys are growing. Even though earlier in this chapter, he kind of gets in throughout throughout these letters, he kind of gets sarcastic with them at times as they believe they're somewhat something else. He says, you're learning in this. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, then do this. If this is the case, they were a church that was struggling to grow in Jesus Christ. They were all up in themselves thinking that they had it going on. But we know from the first letter and even through the way Paul talks to them in many instances in the second letter that they were a church that was, yes, still imperfect, just like us. A church that was still learning how to grow just like us in their walk with Jesus Christ and how to function together and how to encourage each other and not look at ourselves who are higher than some of those who are poorer than us in the church. We're all together. We're all equals, right? He says that we're equal in the church and giving and we're equal in giving to the body of Christ across, okay, even into Jerusalem is their call. But thus maybe it's across Hagerstown. We know a church whose building burns down or a church is struggling right now or they have, a, they have a common cause to support a ministry somewhere and the Lord leads us to help out. We need to be ready. And at the very core of being ready is knowing who we are in Jesus Christ. Knowing what we have in Jesus Christ. His good grace is given us so we can give the grace out to others. And that we are about the business of God the Father, not the United States government. Sometimes we get that backwards. Sometimes we put our patriotism before our desire to serve the Lord. That sounds like a a bummer on Independence Weekend. But where is, where is our desire? As we leave here every week, we've been given some words from God's word of challenge. And this week, I think the challenge is very clear. It comes under the the umbrella of financial giving. But my friends, we're talking about giving as a whole. What we've been taught here today is a fact of Am I living for myself or am I living for the kingdom of God? Because living for the kingdom of God speaks clearly and loudly that we are living a life of giving back. We have been called ambassadors. We have been told that we have this message of reconciliation to give, as Paul speaks in these two letters. This message of reconciliation between man, sinful man, and God. And when it comes to any of our giving, There's not one of us in this room that couldn't give just a little more than what we have. Or a little more in the church body because maybe we've been vacant at times. The underlying challenge is, where is my desire? Where is my commitment? First to God. family, with God at the center, and not church ministry, but church family. See, 
if it's focused on church family or church ministry, that can throw it off because I'm not called to that ministry or I'm not, I can't do it on that night or, you know, it's just another thing I got to do in my life, you know? But when we consider it church family and the needs of this family, it reminds us that we are part of this body in this family, this church body, okay? And, you know, I may be, I, you know, we all have physical ailments about us. We know what it's like when a physical ailment holds us back from being able to do something, okay? Well, that's what happens when I'm not involved in the church family where God has planted me. I become, I become a, a little bit of a hindrance to what the body wants to do because God's, God's got us all called together to be part to make this happen. If it's a knee that's a problem, Ask Greg, ask Jeff, ask Miss Brenda, ask Miss Betty. If it's a knee, it's a problem, you start compensating with everything else. Next thing you know, it becomes your hip. Next thing you know, you can't, you can't bend over without spreading your legs really wide. Because it's your knee and maybe your lower back that's so tight. Because you're compensating for an issue that's plaguing you. Let's not be that issue in this body. We are free in Christ. We're free from the worries of finances. Oh, we can make choices that bind us, but that's not because of anything other than choices we've made. Get free from those. We're free in Christ from having to worry about our needs, having to worry roof over our head, having to worry about food on our plate because God has said, I will meet your needs. Do we believe that to the depths, the very depths of our needs? Why well, can't function without a roof over my head? Read some stories of some missionaries and people in other countries who love the Lord and yet are living under a tarp with holes in it or worshiping under tarps with holes in them. Enjoy what you have. Enjoy the freedom this weekend that America has afforded you. But my friends, as we said earlier, don't forget the freedom we've received through Jesus Christ. To be free from the worries and the stresses of this life. We don't have to worry about them. Concerned about them? Yeah. But worried about them? We've got to take action. God's given us the ability to take action. But I do not need to lie awake at night worried because God's got it. Amen? Amen? Which means then we're free to give as he leads. Hmm. Happy July 4th weekend, even though it's only the second. Enjoy the time. Enjoy your family. And again, let's reflect back to those who have given to us and what it costs. And reflect back to our salvation and what it costs for that in Jesus Christ. And may we live to glorify him in all that we do. Amen.